In the world of English language learning and teaching, there is an obsession with the native speaker. And recently, I spoke with someone who explains exactly why that has to stop. Marek Kichkobiak from TEFL Equity Advocates. This interview is essential viewing for anybody learning English, but especially for non-native English teachers. I hope you enjoy it. Marek Kichkoviak, thank you very much for talking to me today. Thanks for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, for people who don't know you and, and what you do, could you talk a little bit about um, TEFL Equity, you know, what it is and what it does? Yeah, sure. So um, I started um, TEFL Equity Advocates and Academy a couple of years back um, in response to um, the job ads that you see for native speakers um, only and the very very common um, in English language teaching I'm sure lots of our viewers have have seen them as well language schools advertising themselves that they have native speakers um, only and in response to that you know I started this campaign to try to promote I think I would call it not just equality but professionalism in our um, in English language teaching that you know it's not your mother tongue that makes you a good teacher or your nationality it's your skills experience uh training um and so on that makes you a good teacher so um the website now has a has a blog uh there are training courses also for non-native speaker teachers where they can uh, learn how to boost their um chances of of getting hired and what to do how to respond to this prejudice from from recruiters there are resources for for teachers who would like to promote equality um also practical resources to use in the classroom for for teachers and and weekly blogs as well so so where do you think that the majority of this problem comes from do you think that it comes from um the students who want uh native speaking teachers or is it from uh, the employers who only want to hire native speaker teachers. Do you have any idea, maybe, where what the root of this problem is? I don't. I don't think there is a single root of the problem because if you look at something very similar, let's say sexism, right? So the idea that you know women are, for example, not suited for certain jobs because we think of them as weak, for example, right? It's very difficult to identify what's the root cause of that, that there is just one. There are many factors, I think, that are involved in perpetuating this idea that native all native speakers are better language models, better teachers. Um, of course, one, one cause is definitely uh, the way schools advertise themselves, right? Because if you go around, you're based in Spain, right, I believe? You go around any Spanish city and look at how language schools advertise themselves. You'll see profesores nativos everywhere, right? You look, you look at the uh, the leaflets that they give out. It's it's everywhere. So it, you know, this certainly reinforces the idea that a school must have native speakers, right? But you know, of course, schools will tell you that that then this is motivated by the demand from students, right? And certainly, there are students who prefer having classes with native speakers. So that kind of creates a circle. The more schools advertise, the more students expect to have native speakers in a language school and the more schools advertise for that. And it, it goes on and on and on. Um, obviously, you know, if you, if you ask someone, do you prefer to learn a language from a native or a non-native speaker, especially someone who might have failed at learning languages, who haven't learned languages a lot, the obvious answer is, of course, I want to learn from a native speaker. That's that's the most obvious answer. But I think it's the wrong question to ask. And also the way the schools frame this question is the wrong way to frame it. Because the difference between, let's say, you as, an, as a native speaker and me, a non-native, is not our first language. It's our experience. It's our skills. It's our qualifications. So I think as a student, for example, if you're choosing a teacher, you shouldn't just base it on the first language. You should find out what kind of qualifications your teacher has. You should find out if you're preparing for an exam. Does your teacher know how to prepare you for an exam? Or maybe take a teacher who has actually taken this exam. That might be preferable. Or what kind of experience does your, does your teacher have? You want to uh, give better sales presentation to your business clients in English. 
does your teacher have experience and, and a good track record of that, right? So I, you know, you th I think you have to go a little bit deeper than that because superficially, obviously the obvious answer, yes, I want to have classes with native speakers, but that's, that's not the, you know, that's not the, that's not the point. I think, I think you have to go a little bit deeper uh, than that. And, you know, there are other also, um, let's say causes of why some people might prefer native speakers. For example, in certain countries, perhaps people have been disappointed with uh, how little they have learned in public schools, right? So people study English for seven, eight years in public schools, and then they come out and they still can't speak English. And, you know, the, the idea forms that, okay, I've, I've had classes for seven years with local non-native speakers, and I can't speak English. That obviously means that all non-native speakers are crap. That's, that's kind of the idea that is formed. And it's, you know, it's logical that, that this idea is formed. But in, in a sense, you know, it's not really, you, you don't speak English after seven years of classes in a public school, not because you've had classes with non-native speakers, but because you've had classes with bad teachers, right? Uh, and the same can apply to native speakers. There's, there's plenty of native speakers who are, who are bad teachers. Um, and, and the problem is as well that because the schools advertise so much for native speakers, and perhaps some of our viewers uh, don't know that, you know, they, they hire sometimes barely qualified uh, with no experience native speakers. I've, I've had so many uh, native speaking colleagues who are now, you know, fantastic teachers. But if you ask them, how did you start? Well, I just kind of showed up in Spain because I, I wanted to be somewhere warm and I walked into a language school and I got a job. And then at some point I got qualified and more experienced. And it's, it's very common that that happens, right? Um, so, so I think, you know, I, I would say if you're, if you're a student of English and, and you want to choose a teacher, I think you have to look at every, every detail, how proficient they are you know, what qualifications they have, what experience they have, what specific experience that is related to what you want to learn they have. Have they learned foreign languages? I think that's, that's super important as well. Look, I agree a thousand percent with everything you've said, but what about the student? What would you say to the student who says, well, I need a native, spe I need a native speaker because, you know, they, they, they know all these little kind of details about the language that you just can't get if you're a non-native speaker. You know, like they might teach me something, I don't know, strange or weird or like, for example, if I'm in Morocco and my teacher is Moroccan, maybe I'm going to learn Moroccan English and that won't be the right type of English that I need. Yeah, so of, of course, yeah, there is, there is this idea that as a native speaker, you're kind of, you're, you're beyond even you know the highest proficiency level you live in your own world of the highest possible proficiency but that's um you know that's of course only true for very highly educated native speakers um and what we also need to understand i think for for people who speak spanish uh, or who are from spain that will be very easy to understand that you know a language that is so global like spanish or english uh, nobody ever can know the, all of it, right? So to give you a practical example, um, I've been watching Casa de Papel um, with, my, with my girlfriend, and she's Costa Rican, so she's a native Spanish speaker. She's supposed to know this stuff. But we're watching it with subtitles, and we still don't understand what they say. Why? Because it's just a different kind of Spanish. It's a Spanish that we have never heard. Well, we've heard it sometimes on TV, but it's a Spanish we don't understand very often, right? So the fact that she's a native speaker doesn't mean that she knows this stuff. Of course, she does know, you know, a lot of colloquialisms or expressions from her country, right? Uh, but equally, I know a lot as well because I spent two years there and you know, and I can also, if I want to confuse people in Spain by using expressions that they would never know in Spanish, right? And um, so that's, I think that's one point that we, that we need to look at. And the second point is that the, the fact that you know something doesn't mean that you're able to convey that knowledge, you know? So if you, if you think about it, you know, if you were to choose, a, let's say, a tennis uh, coach, 
you know, it, it might be nice to train with Roger Federer, right? I think it would be brilliant, but it doesn't necessarily mean that Roger Federer would be a good coach for your kid. Maybe he doesn't have the patience. By the way, I don't know anything about Roger Federer. I, I really admire him. I think he's a fantastic tennis player. Maybe he has a lot of patience. But, you know, the, the fact that you're the best at something doesn't necessarily mean that you can convey that knowledge. These are completely two different things. So when you're choosing a teacher, whether the native speaker or there's somebody who's completely bilingual, completely proficient in English, that there's all sorts of people who are proficient in English but they, they don't teach the language because they don't know how to teach it, right? And another point perhaps to make is that it also depends who you want to communicate with, right? So I imagine, and I can understand that, let's say if your specific goal is to maybe go and live in Sydney, right? And, and move there and completely integrate into that society, you probably need a teacher who's very familiar with the way people use English in Sydney. That could be a native speaker from Sydney, but it could also be a non-native speaker who has spent a lot of time there and is very familiar with that dialect. But that's a very specific goal. I think most of you uh, and most people in the world use English for international communication, right? When you're in Spain, you, meet, you will meet tourists from England, maybe some Americans as well, but you will meet plenty of Polish people, Germans, Belgians, French people, Italians coming to Spain and they will be speaking English to you because not everybody knows Spanish, right? So in that case, actually knowing some um, colloquialisms or some specific expressions from a native speaking country that only a native speaker will know is actually a disadvantage because if you use them, you're likely to confuse people. Just as Casa de Papel confuses me because they use specific expressions from a specific region in Spain and I just don't know them, right? As a joke, several times I've given various members of my family and my wife's family, I've given them um, writing tests from the IELTS exam, and they are terrible. No, and, and, and on that note, on, on IELTS, you're, you're absolutely right. And uh, viewers can, can look up this, these statistics themselves. I'm not, I'm not lying here at all. I, they're, they're all public on IELTS website. But if you look at the last time I looked, it was um, official IELTS results for 2015. And they've got them collated by different first language of participants, the country uh, they come from. And there's, there's a lot of native speakers who have to take IELTS, for example, to emigrate to countries like Australia. Um, you have to prove your proficiency level for certain skilled jobs, right, and skilled visas. So um, guess what was the average score of a native speaker on IELTS Academic in 2015? Well, actually, I, I, I know the answer to this question because I've looked at this exact table myself. I think it's about 7.1 7 or something, I think, for English first language. Isn't it about 7? It was 6.5. 6.5? It was 6 .5. 6 .5. <laughs> so even, even if it was 7 or, or 7.5 or 8, you know, it's, it's still low. There was actually, I think, as far as I remember, only 1% of native speakers scored 9 on IELTS, you know? And of course, when you look at job ads now, I've recently saw, saw a job ad for British Council, and they request non-native speakers to have straight 9 on IELTS to be able to apply. I mean, that's, it's, it's mad, no matter how, look at it. But it, you know, it all comes back to this idea that we have that, a native speaker is more proficient than any non-native speaker can ever be. But that's, of course, not true. You could argue that, I mean, IELTS wasn't developed for native speakers, so it doesn't test native speaker proficiency. It's a test of academic English. Maybe some people, some native speakers taking it, they didn't prepare. Um, maybe they, they're not well educated. They've never been to university, for example. They don't know how to write essays. You could make up all of these excuses, but you would never, in contrast, you would never make up those excuses for non-native speakers who scored low, right? You just assume they scored low because their English isn't good enough. So it seems to me that the problem has perhaps three aspects, and I'd like to sort of break down those three aspects. So what, one that we've already talk, kind of talked about is how students need to adjust their attitudes. You know, students need to realize that when they're choosing a teacher that choosing a teacher just based on their native language is is just not a good not a good way to choose a teacher right 
And then maybe the, the second and third problems would probably be um, the, the employers themselves who, who only want to hire native speakers. And then the, the second sort of part of this is also the teachers themselves who are non-natives. So I, I was wondering if we could start with number two and talk about non-native teachers who are in the market right now looking for a job. What can they do to help themselves to get hired? That's a very good, uh, very good question. I, uh, I've been working on that uh, quite a lot, and uh, I've just actually published a, a blog post on my on my website, um, how to get TEFL jobs as a non-native speaker in two thousand and, and, and nineteen. And I, I think there's there's so much that as a non-native speaker uh, you can do to get hired because look, there's th there is a certain small percentage of non-native of uh, recruiters sorry, who will never hire you, right? No matter what you do, they will never hire you. But it's, it's a tiny percentage. I think a lot of recruiters just need a little bit of convincing and they, they will hire you. So um, one thing that you, that you definitely need to do is you need to make sure that you've got, uh, you've got a good proficiency test on C1 level, at least, because that's what all recruiters will request. You need to have some sort of TEFL certification, CELTA, DELTA, uh, Trinity Cert, Tr DIP, TESOL, uh, those kind of qualifications if you want to work in a language school, right? Um, and then um, I think you need to start thinking about your own advantages as a teacher. What can you bring to the table? Because we've been talking so much about why native speakers are supposedly better teachers, right? And all the language schools market themselves like that as well. That is very easy, I think, to forget you know, the amazing strengths that you've got as a teacher who has learned English themselves, right? And I think you need to use them to market yourself, to convince recruiters that you're the right candidate, or to convince uh, private students to, uh, to have classes with you. So to give you one example, the fact that you have learned English to the highest possible level is, is fantastic combined with your uh, qualifications and experience as a language teacher. Because you know, a native speaker might have learned other languages, but they will have never gone through that process of learning English, right? And I think this can uh, allow you to better understand your students and the struggles that they're going through. You've also struggled with learning the present perfect. You've made the same mistakes your students have made, but you've managed to overcome this problem. And surely you've developed some solutions, practical solutions that are not based on something that you read somewhere. These are solutions based on something you've done. Uh, yourself right and I think that's really really powerful you know so when you have for example students that struggle to learn for example some pronunciation right again you you've done it yourself and I think that can help you motivate uh, your students understand the problems solve these problems and and I always put that on my on my CV you know when I when I talk to employers in job interviews I, I talk a lot about my language learning experience how that helps me as a teacher, my experience of learning English. If I'm applying for a job uh, to teach exams, I, you know, talk about your experience uh, passing high stakes exams such as IELTS, uh, CPE, or any other exam that you've passed. I think that's fantastic. There aren't any native speakers teaching English probably who have done exams themselves, right? And I think I think it's a great advantage uh, as well because you you've been through that exam through all that stress you've done all those prep materials and again you've developed probably really good solutions for typical problems your students might have so these are just two examples of you know of the strengths that you've got and i think you need to change that mindset because uh, recently i was i i helped um, a czech teacher actually get a get a teaching job in in london and it's you know like his initial attitude reminded me of how I think a lot of na non-native speakers think about themselves. You know, this, this guy has a master's degree in TESOL. He's got the Delta. He's got the CELTA. He's got God knows how many years of experience teaching English. Uh, he's got the CPE, right? He's completely proficient in English. Yet, he, he doesn't feel very confident. He, he, you know, deep down, he feels inferior to native speakers. And even now, when he's, he just got that job, he's still worried that he isn't going to do well, that people are going to judge him because he's a, native, he's a non-native speaker. And I think you really need to change that mindset, right? You, you need to believe in, in, in your abilities and what you can bring 
into the table. You're not a worse teacher at all. And I think that's super, super important to understand. Yeah. And, and you know, I mean, I, I'm also thinking back to, to another thing that you said at the beginning of, of our conversation. You said that, you know, a lot of students want a native teacher now, if they're adults, because they were failed by their, by their terrible kind of non-native teacher at, at, you know, when they were at primary school or high school. And like in my personal experience here in Spain, I think that that is actually a big part of the problem that I never really thought about before. Because, you know, even now, like I, you know, I know some teachers who are, who are there teaching in primary schools who, who can't even string together a basic sentence. And, you know, like you said, the problem is that they, they are in, in an indirect way damaging the reputation of all non-native kind of teachers yeah. yeah i think i think that's that's definitely uh that's definitely true and you know I, I think those those teachers any any teacher i think should should work on the on professional development and and if you know that your proficiency is slightly lower than it should be then work on it i mean now in 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 the 21st century there's literally no excuse um, I think for or there's very little excuse in developed countries such as Spain um, to have low proficiency in English, let's say below B2 as an English teacher, because there are so many free resources as well available to you to improve um, that, that you simply have to improve. And, and I mean, on the other hand, obviously, if you're, let's say, if your weakness is maybe language awareness um and, and teaching grammar then that's something that you have to work on as well there's very little excuse for not knowing that right um but and then and i think you know the government as well has to it it saddens me a lot when governments have these you know very thoughtful solution of basically importing barely qualified native speakers en masse to their country because that's going to solve our language problems no, it isn't. I mean, if you look at Spain, unfortunately, still the average proficiency in Spain is very low. You look at South Korea or Japan, which basically do the same thing. They import native speakers to the JET program in Japan. Their proficiency isn't that great because I, I think that the solution is that you have to help local teachers improve their proficiency, improve the way of teaching. And then they're going to develop the next generation of English, local English teachers who will be even better. And it's just going to get better and better. I was wondering if then, if now we could talk about the third, you know, possible solution to this problem, which is the employers. So like language schools or maybe even um, public institutions, you know, uh, like high schools or, or, or maybe even other types of public institutions, you know, government agencies, whatever. Um, how how can you convince them to hire non-native speakers uh, as teachers? Yeah, um, perhaps the, the strongest argument is that it's already happening. I, I recently conducted a study with over 150 uh, recruiters and and they, they all they all told me that they, they're all starting to change the, the hiring policy. Some did it uh, a while back, some are doing it now. And they, they haven't really seen any drop in clients. Uh, it involves a lot of initial work, and some of them were understandably scared or worried when they started doing it, especially 10, 15 years ago. Um, you know, in small cities, for example, in Spain, where having a British flag basically sold your, your school, right? But what it involves is, is changing Every, every, everything about how you market your school. So uh, the, the, the schools that I've talked to, and it's, you know, it's, it's over 100 employers, they're very successful, but what they've done is basically they, they removed any reference to native or non-native speakers from their websites, from the promotional materials. Uh, they don't advertise themselves with British and American flags. What they do is they advertise themselves by saying, we've got quali highly qualified, proficient, English teachers. We're an international school. We've got teachers from 10 different countries. So, you know, there are some native speakers working there and those native speakers working there, they've been carefully chosen because they're fantastic teachers, not because simply because they're native speakers. Equally, the non-native speakers working there, they're also amazing teachers, right? So in the end, what's happening is that these schools 
end up potentially with better qualified teachers because they're too very carefully picking who they want to work with. And it also, they've told me it, it's created a fantastic atmosphere in the staff room because all the teachers feel equally valued. Uh, because, you know, sometimes you talk to native speakers and they feel that nobody values them because the only thing they're supposed to do is speak, right? So they're never given writing classes or exam classes because they don't know how to do that. And then non-native speakers don't feel valued because they have to teach only lower levels and so on, right? Whereas in schools like that, everybody is happy because everybody is treated in exactly the same way. And these schools have told me that they haven't really seen any drop with, with students. And when students sometimes come to complain, some, some have even given sort of rough figures that, you know, in the last year in a school where they have a thousand students, there has been one parent who came to complain. And that's, and that's it. So it's not such a big issue as you might think, right? It's not that all of a sudden you will lose half of your clients, right? And, and, but when parents or students do come and ask about native speakers at the reception or they, they complain, um, you have to be prepared to respond to them and say, for example, look, we don't guarantee that your son or daughter will have classes with a native speaker immediately. We have teachers from 10 different countries. There are teachers from also Australia and Britain, but there are Polish people, Brazilians teaching English here. So your son will or daughter will have classes with teachers from different nationalities, but all our teachers have a master's degree. Uh, they're highly proficient. They've been teaching English for at least five years and so on. You, you kind of, you have to sell them a little bit. What other schools also offer is free demonstration classes. And parents as well, there's, there's one day in a month or, or in a semester where parents can come in and watch their kids have classes uh, in, the, in the school, right? And that, that immediately um, helps as well because I think a lot of people initially, they have this idea, oh, no, I, I will learn from English from a Polish person. What? Uh, that's a very strange idea, right? But it's, if the teacher is good and, and you go into the class, you, you will usually stay. And, and, and I think that's, uh, that's the point. So, so I think it is, it is already happening and it's only going to happen more and more because um, a lot of these employers actually told me as well that they have noticed, started to notice a change as well in, in, um, in customers and what they want. Uh, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, people would come in and the only thing they wanted was a British teacher. That's it. That's the only thing they cared about. Now that's, that's changing a lot. People, you know, ask about other things and, and, and they're not so concerned about having just native speakers, right? So, uh, so I think, you know, if you're an employer, I think that's the, that's the future, really. That's, you know, and I, and I think you want to get on board as soon as possible. I understand that it's worrying uh, because you, you worry that you will lose your clients, but I don't think you will. If it's, if it's done correctly, if you implement it well, there's, there's literally hundreds of language schools who have done it um, recently, a long time ago, and, and they're still successful. They're still doing great. To, to me, the, the, the most interesting part for me was talking about how it switches your, it switches the entire kind of philosophy of the school from teaching English to becoming an international school. I love that distinction. And, you know, I think it's important as well for people to realize that, you know, like it's estimated about 80% of conversations in English every day are between non-native speakers, right? And, and like you said, you know, English is an international language of communication. And so by training people, by training students to speak to Germans and Polish people and, and you know, that, that's a much more realistic scenario. And, and you're right, I think it is the future. And, and maybe those schools that don't change, right, that continue with this whole, you know, British flag thing, Maybe they're the ones that are actually going to get left behind. I think so. I think I think that's uh, that might happen. And you know, and from a business perspective, I I honestly think that if you focus on um, hiring qualified, experienced, proficient, skilled language teachers, regardless of where they're from, you're looking at a much larger pool of teachers, right? Because at the moment, if you're limiting yourself just to, especially in the EU, you need teachers who have um, working rights in the EU. So it would be just Britain and Ireland, basically, right? 
it's a very, very narrow pool of teachers which you can choose from. Imagine now you open yourself up to all the teachers from the EU if you're a language school owner in, in Spain. Surely there's, before you've been missing out on some incredible language teachers that you just, you even haven't looked at their CV because they were non-native speakers. So I think in the end, you will end up with more highly qualified uh, staff. And, and I think in the end, what all language learners want, they want to learn a language and, and they want to have a good teacher. So I think from a business perspective, I think it does make sense. And, and it just takes, that's what those employers told me as well. It, it takes taking the first step. And, and the first step is always the most difficult. You need to hire your first non-native speaker teacher. Uh, and then from there, it will be, it will be easier. Awesome. Well, Marek, thank you very much for, your, for speaking to me. Um, please continue to fight the good fight and change the world. And anything I can do to, to support you, just, just let me know. All right. Thanks a lot.